Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, we're going to be starting right now. Welcome to our school mental health to make engagement stronger and more resilient learning from the COVID-19 crisis. This is a day two virtual conference. The 2021 Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC School Mental Health Summit brings together leaders, practitioners, researchers, and other stakeholders in the school mental health field to share the latest research and best practices. The conference emphasizes a shared school, family, community agenda to bring high quality and evidence-based mental health promotion, prevention, and intervention to students and families as part of a multi-tier system of support. This conference is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC, hosted at Rutgers School of Mental Health Professionals, Department of Psychiatric Habilitation and Consultant Professionals. My name is Caribet Sanaria Velez, and I am the Senior Training and Consultation Specialist for Mental Health Lead here in Puerto Rico of this center, and I will be hosting this conference session today along with our presenter. This session is day two, is teaching through transition back to school, back to basic. Also today we will have session five, 1.45 to 3 p.m. Eastern time helping my grieving students when COVID loss comes into the school. The full schedule and individual Zoom links can be found in our conference webpage. The MHTTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Sustain Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to enhance the capacity of behavioral health and other related workforce to deliver evidence-based and empirically support practices to individuals with mental health illness. We have also been awarded additional supplement funding focused on enhancing students' mental health in schools. Please visit MHTTC Network website for additional information at mhttcnetwork.org. Funded by the Sustain Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the MHTTC Network includes three 10 region centers a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a Network Coordinator Officer. In our center is Region 2, servicing New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the United States Virgin Islands. Supplement funding was awarded to provide a training and technical assistance to teachers and school staff regarding students' mental health. This objective of the academy is to communicate the importance of mental health support in schools, enhancing the capacity to recognize and identify mental health concerns in students, and to educate staff on the best models of school-based mental health services and when is in the community-based services. We have the capacity and expertise to provide national webinars, general trainings, professional development meetings, and intensive technical assistance consultation services on school mental health around young mental health first aid trauma-informed schools, cultural resiliency, suicide prevention, social emotional learning, crisis interventions, school refusal anxiety, self-care. Also provide technical assistance in legalized plans with schools, implementing school mental health resources, mapping, need assessment, teaming, assessment, tire support, and funding. If you are interested in staying up to date with the elements and product of the New East and Caribbean MHTTC is providing, please sign up and you'll receive our email communication. You can sign up our bit link that it will be provided in the share box. Following the webinar, you will ask to complete a brief survey. We value you this feedback and we use it to promote our activities and inform future activities. The surveys are also important because our continued funding is linked to the completing of this service. So we thank you in advance for your feedback. 
We will also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted in our conference website along with the PowerPoint slides within the week of this conclusion of this conference. This presentation was prepared for the North East and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center under the cover of the agreement for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. All materials appearing in this presentation expect and thanks directly to the copyright resources is in a public domain and may be responded or copied without permission from SANSA or the authors. Citation of the resources is appreciated. Do not reproduce or distribute this presentation for a fee without specific writing authorized from the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. This presentation will be recorded and posted in our website. At the time of the presentation, Miriam Delphine Whitman, save as Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Sustainable Use at SAMHSA, the opinions expressed herein are in the view of the speakers and do not relate to the official position of the Department of Health of Human Rights Services or SAMHSA. No official support on interest of DHS, SAMHSA, for the opinion described in this presentation is intended and should be inferred. We encourage, encourage you to interact with our presenter during the webinar by using the chat box. In the future, please post any comments or questions you have in the chat and we also will collect your questions and we go and answer them in the Q&A. During this webinar presentation, may post questions to you. Please use the chat future and answer these questions. The MHTTC network uses a framing, respectful, and very oriented language in all activities. This includes language that is trend based on the hopeful, language that is exclusive and explicit and diverse culture, gender perspective, and experiences, language that is healing, centered, and trauma responsive language that is individuals and participate in their own recovery journey, language that is person first and free of labels, language that is not judgmental and avoid assumptions, language that is respectful, clear, understandable of consistent our actions, policy and products. We have today Dr. Steve Massa with us today. Dr. Steve Massa is a licensed clinical psychologist and faculty member of Columbia University Center. Dr. Massa has extensive experience training parents, teachers, and summer camps administrators how to interact most effectively with children. Dr. Massa received his BS in elementary education from Skidmore College, his MA in developmental psychology from Columbia University, and his PhD in clinical psychology from Hofstar University. Dr. Massa is the developer of the Brave Start Protocol from Training Early Childhood Disorder and is coordinator of the ABC Early Childhood Program at Columbia University. He has appeared in a Sirius XM Dr. Radio and has written articles published in company magazines and the journal Rational Emotional and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Dr. Massa is also a founder and executive director of the Play It Forward 501c3 nonprofit organization that helps musicians raise money for charity at www.playitforward.com. We will return it over to with Dr. Massa now. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, really generous introduction there. Um, so I am very excited to be here. Uh, before we start, I just want to make sure is, um, am I uh, in the center of the screen? Or does everyone see, does everyone see a um, multitude of people right now? I, we see the, the, the speaker boxes. Okay, great, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, very excited to be here today. I come from a cognitive behavioral therapy perspective. Uh, that's the training that we get in uh, for clinical psychology. But I also come from an education perspective because I, I majored in elementary education in college. So this is kind of a nice marriage of uh, my early interests as well as uh, some of the training I did later on. So this will be a little bit untraditional in that I, I don't use PowerPoints during my 
during my presentations. And that's because I, I really want you to remember some of this content in the moment while you're interacting with students. And for me, if I'm interacting with a child, it's hard for me to bring into mind a power, like a PowerPoint slide. It's more likely that I would remember like, what was that guy with the beach ball saying? So I, I use visuals. I try, to, I try to make it entertaining and comedic in a way because I want you to be in the classroom and for images of what we talk about to pop into your mind. The, the approach I take is teaching the principles of human psychology. By doing this, it's kind of like giving you a map so that when you're in different situations in the classroom, you can figure it out yourself. Rather than just teaching you tricks for transitions, uh, for example, like a sticker chart, not only does that not apply to you know, K through 12, but it's not gonna help you in various situations. So my approach to teaching is teaching the principles and then applying those principles to specific scenarios. And today the scenario is teaching through transitions, really just adjusting to going back to school. The, uh, other than just being a clinical psychologist and working with kids and families, I do uh, public speeching, uh, speaking and training for teachers, for parents, and also for camp counselors. So uh, this summer I've been doing lots of camp talks and I noticed as I was preparing for this talk, I kept saying campers instead of students. So I apologize in advance if I'm just, if I'm having trouble transitioning back to school here, cause I'm still in summer camp mode a little bit. So the, the first thing um, that I wanna share here is a, an extrapolation from a psychological principle. Some of you may be familiar with, it, it's called good enough parenting. This is the goal for, for parents. It's to do the best you can in the situation you have. And I, I wanna say that before all the different skills I'm about to teach you, I want you to practice good enough teaching. The idea here is that you don't have to be perfect. It would actually be detrimental to expect that you're gonna be perfect with these skills, because as you know, there's so much that goes on in the classroom and there are so many different conflicting needs among students that it's, not, it's much easier said than done. So as I go through these skills, I'm probably gonna make it sound easy. I want you to keep in mind it's not, it's just about applying the principles to the best of your ability in what's often a very challenging situation in the classroom. So good enough teaching is the goal here. Now, I'm gonna start with a riddle. I'm gonna ask that uh, you not put any of the answers in the text yet, um, in the chat. You can maybe wait till the end, even though I think a lot of you are gonna know the uh, solution to this riddle right off the bat, but it'll make it more interesting if we present it this way. So the riddle is, what is the reward that students crave most. Think about it for a minute. I'm gonna share my screen here. The, although I don't have PowerPoints, uh, I do appreciate how important it is to have visuals and learning. And by the way, you can download, I have 10 pages of handouts that, I, that cover everything we're talking about. So you can download all of it afterwards if you wanna refer back to some of these concepts like before the first day of school. Steve, we're attempting to put it in the chat box. Oh, great. Uh, to put what in the chat box? those resources that you said. Oh, the link. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so the riddle, once again, is what is the reward that students crave most? Clue number one, you carry this reward with you wherever you go. So you have it with you in the classroom, you have it with you in the, in the teacher lounge, in the gym, the cafeteria, you always got it with you, which makes it a very convenient reward, by the way. Clue number two, You are distributing this reward to your students moment to moment, even if you don't realize it, right? You're distributing this reward moment to moment. Clue number three, different students learn different strategies to get the reward. So some students will learn to sit quietly, to ask respectfully, to raise their hands every time, right? Other students will learn to act out, to misbehave, to interrupt, right? Everyone finds a different way of getting this reward. And then number four is that adults tend to give even more of this reward while students act out. This is the natural way it goes, by the way, but. Uh, it's an unfortunate reality that kids get more of this reward when they're doing the wrong behaviors. And then uh, lastly, for those interested in child development, 
uh, when infants and kids in really early childhood don't get any of this reward, uh, oftentimes they have difficulty having healthy attachment relationships, sometimes for the rest of their lives. So that's how important this reward is. Uh, now, I imagine a lot of you already know this, or all of you may know, may get a sense for what this is. Um, put it in the chat. I see some of you have already done this. There we go. Attention. Now, this is back to school and back to basics, right? So I know that this seems simple, but actually using your attention strategically in the moment is not simple. It's really counterintuitive. So there's analogies I'm going to use to kind of drive this point home. Point is, kids love your attention. The, you know, the younger they are, the more they want it. As they get older, they also obviously crave the attention of their peers more so. But even if you're teaching high school seniors, your attention is going to be pretty rewarding. So the idea is for, for students, attention is like candy. All right. They will do whatever it takes to get it. If you were to ask your classroom, please sit down quietly. And there's you know, no motivation right there. Maybe they will sit down. Maybe they'll take a little while to quiet down. But if you hold up a whole bag of Reese's peanut butter cups, and say, if you sit down quietly, you will get this. They will quickly sit down, right? So I want you to think that you're, think about it as if your attention's like candy. And there are three types of candy I wanna to teach today. The first I call sweet attention, okay? This is positive reinforcement. You're all familiar with that, positive attention. So this is high fives, uh, thumbs up, uh, uh, great job listening, awesome work with the topic sentence of that essay, right? It's all the positive stuff. So I, I usually say it's kind of like Ben and Jerry's ice cream on a hot summer day. Like everyone eats it, everyone loves it, no one feels bad about it afterwards. So use sweet attention as much as you can all day long. That rewards kids for adjusting well to school during a transition and rewards them for whatever they're doing. Now there's a dark side of attention that you're all aware of, typically known as negative attention. I call it sour attention because I really run with this candy analogy. But sour attention, is raising your voice, yelling, criticizing, giving commands without really concern for what the students care about. Sarcasm with the younger ones is usually like sour attention. So these are the things that kind of take a hit on the kid's self-esteem. And unfortunately, the truth here is that negative behaviors call more sour attention to them than positive behaviors do. Like then positive behaviors call the, you know, the sweet attention. So the sour attention is like a guilty pleasure food that kids will eat it up all day long. It's like they can't help themselves. They just want more. And then they feel guilty about it when it's over or they feel ashamed at the end of the day when their head hits the pillow. It, it's, it's like, um, well, you ever sat on a couch uh, with a bag of potato chips and said, I'm just going to have one handful. How does that usually go? Right. If you're like me, you end up eating half the bag or the whole bag and then you don't feel good afterwards. So the idea is like kids get addicted to sour attention. It's like um, extreme Sour Patch Kids. If you've ever had that, the first bite of it, at least for me, was like, whoa, oh, this is really intense. And you're like, I kind of like this. I kind of like more, right? And then you start eating it. So kids get quickly, quickly addicted to sour attention. And on day one of school, they're going to learn whether or not it's more fun to get sour attention or sweet attention from their teacher. A um, good example of this, if you are, let's say you're an art teacher. And little Johnny is, uh, you know, working on his construction paper art project and he's gluing it together and everything's going very well. It's unlikely that in that moment you will be called to say, Johnny, great job quietly working on your art project. Like that's just almost unnatural, right? Now, maybe Johnny will get like a, hey, nice, nice, quiet working. Maybe it's like a little skittle feels good. Uh, but if Johnny then takes all of the glue and start spreading it around on the table and spreading it on his neighbor's faces, then what kind of attention is he gonna get? He's gonna get a lot of sour attention, typically. And if it were me in that scenario, I'd go, Johnny, just, you know, stop, stop with the glue, stop with the glue, right? So that's, that's much more stimulating and rewarding to a child, especially if they're having trouble sitting still, if they have ADHD or, or if they're you know, too anxious to, to sit still, just to get some kind of stimulation and some kind of distraction from their current experience. So the sour attention just naturally is more rewarding. There's more sugar on it than the sweet attention. And so what I'm sure you've noticed in your careers is that the trajectory throughout the school year, and it can happen throughout the first day, the first week, the first month, 
is that the negative behaviors just naturally call for more attention. And so the child and the teacher get into this coercive cycle is what they call it, where there's more negative behavior and more negative attention and they kind of fuel each other. So we wanna put an end to that, however challenging it is. Uh, there's a third type of attention I haven't gotten to yet, but I'll get there. Uh, so the way I like to really drive this point home is with, uh, it's called the vending machine analogy. I didn't make it up. Anyone here knows who made up the vending machine analogy? Let me know. I want to write them a thank you card. So the vending machine analogy is basically the idea is like, let's say there's a vending machine right here. Okay. And you are very hungry. So you find your, you look at the vending machine, you look at all the choices, you find your favorite candy. Um, maybe someone could throw out a favorite candy. If you want to put it in the chat, just put in any, any, any candy that you like and I'll, I'll choose one of yours. Payday. Okay. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't gotten payday before. Payday came first. So we're doing payday. That's a good one. Okay. Thank you for your participation, by the way. So you put in your dollar, right? I haven't been to a vending machine in a while. Maybe they're like $3 nowadays, but you put in your, your $3, you see F10 for, for payday, you press it. You're all pumped about the, 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 you know, the candy and you press dispense. Let's say nothing happens. Okay. Nothing happens at all when you're hungry. What realistically might your next step be to try to get this candy? You can put it in the chat. How are you going to get this candy out of the vending machine? Shake, shake, shake. <laughs> nice. Okay, shake it, kick it. Okay. It's funny because people always go to like the aggressive behaviors towards the vending machine. Um, I, I imagine, and it, it happens every time, but I imagine that realistically, you might put in, you know, you might press the button again or press dispense or, or, or try to get your dollar back. So you try some things like that. Say none of that works. Then maybe you start shaking it, right? So you shake it, shake the vending machine. That doesn't work. So then maybe you shake it harder. Let's say you're shaking the vending machine pretty hard and then you see the payday start to move. So now you get invigorated, right? You're like, okay, this is working. So you shake it even harder. I hope I'm not making anyone too dizzy. Um, if nothing works, eventually you might just, uh, you know, kick the machine or since I'm not gonna stand up right now, maybe take your elbow, bash the machine with it. The payday drops. You open it up, ah, it's delicious. Congratulations, your behavioral escalation paid off. Your aggression paid off. Okay, next time you go to this vending machine, maybe you'll put in your, your dollar, your $3 and press F10 for the payday. But let's say that doesn't work. What behavior are you going to jump straight to doing? You put it in the chat, but you don't have to. Yeah, same, yeah. Thank you. Um, exactly what worked last time, right? So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to, you know, try to get your dollar back and do it again, to press the button gently. Wouldn't even make sense to shake it gently and shake it harder and then shake it harder. None of that stuff works. You go straight to doing what worked last time, which is elbow the machine or bang the machine. So why am I talking about vending machines? Yeah, I mean, you know where this is going. It's that children learn to escalate their behavior from zero to 100 because of this process. Right? Because they get rewarded, usually with the attention of an adult or by escaping a situation or getting something they want, by escalating their behavior enough right, that they get re reinforced at the height of the escalation. And that's a problem. right? This is happening with these transitions to school. A lot of these kids have been at home with their parents for, for too long, and they've gotten into these cycles, these coercive cycles I talked about, where they are getting reinforced, especially if their parents working from home, they're getting reinforced for banging on the door loud enough, for tantruming loud enough. And if it's a teenager for just being uh, irritable enough, short enough, for, for slamming the door enough, right? So that we call that a learning history. Then you have the anxious ones who are so afraid to separate from their parents or so afraid to be around COVID that they're throwing uh, tantrums or just shutting down out of anxiety, all of it is, is probably getting reinforced at home by a lot of these parents because they don't know what else to do in a situation just to de-escalate it. So now they're in your classroom. Now it's a whole new context and there's new anxieties, right? And there's, there's uh, new challenges with regard to focusing on schoolwork. So you have this opportunity to choose what kind of vending machine you're gonna be on day one. In a new context, there's new learning. So you can work against these patterns that have been reinforced at home. Right? So the idea is you're a vending machine to your students. Will you be the kind of vending machine that only provides the candy of your attention 
when they're pressing the buttons gently, putting in their dollar? Or will you be the vending machine that gives them more candy when they're kicking and shaking the machine? Now, easier said than done, obviously, right? Because there's, there's a lot of behaviors that need to be addressed, but I'm just gonna get a little bit more concrete here and what, what you do as this vending machine. Number one, back to basics, you've heard this a million times, catch students being good, right? This is finding every moment that, that a student is doing well and then opening up the vending machine at that time with your, with your praises, right? This is especially important for the students who get really antsy if they're not getting any attention, right? You gotta catch them in the moments that they're doing the right thing or they're gonna jump to doing the wrong thing to get that sour attention. Now, there's two kinds of attention. I mean, two kinds of praises that in psychology we teach teachers and parents. You might be familiar with these as well. It's unlabeled and labeled. Unlabeled is the most common that all adults, camp counselors, teachers use. And it's like, thanks, nice job, good work. I love that, awesome, right? So the, that's great. That's like a Skittle. Feels good to get unlabeled praise. But if you really wanna see a behavior again, we wanna give them like a whole candy bar. That is the labeled praise, okay? Um, labeled praise is just where you specify exactly what it was that the student did that you like. So um, imagine for a moment that you had a, um, a principal observing a class of yours. And afterwards, you get an email. The email says, nice work today. Okay, maybe that's like a Skittle. Maybe it feels good to get a little unlabeled praise. Maybe it's not, maybe you're even worried that uh, they didn't say enough. Maybe they didn't like it. But now let's say the principal says, nice job with your lesson today. I loved how you used enthusiasm and shared your personal experience to, to provide meaning. And it really brought the kids attention in um, and I was just really impressed with how connected you were with them. <laughs> okay. That is like an ice cream sundae, right? You, you, you'd eat that up and you'd know, okay, that's what I'm going to do again next time. So that, that's the principle here that is that you open the vending machine with those labeled praises as much as you can. As the kids get older, you're going to tone down the sugar. It's not like a, a senior in high school wants you to say like, nice job listening. That'd be silly. And they might feel embarrassed. So, you know, you, you, you got to give them the candy they want. Like they might prefer like a subtle, like, Hey, I appreciate Chris, how you've been sitting there quietly or whatever it might be, but you adjust, you would, you adjust the candy to the age group. So, okay. Number one, you catch the kids being good. Now, what about the moments that they are acting out, getting out of the chair or whatever it might be. This is what we call active ignoring. And this is where your vending machine is shut down, total shutdown. So when a camper is, uh, see, I told you I'd say a camper. Sorry about that. When a student is interrupting, right? At this point, you bring your attention to the kids that are doing the right things. And active ignoring involves you're not rolling your eyes. You're not sighing, right? You're not um, responding. You're just waiting. That's why they say active. You're waiting for the behavior to stop. And then as soon as that behavior stops, then you open the vending machine up. Johnny. I really appreciate you waiting patiently, right? Even if they were only waiting, they were only quiet for like three seconds. You find the moment in that period of time to reinforce the behavior, right? And you start this at day one. Now, this is a perfect example of like so much easier said than done. You know, that student is being disruptive. Sometimes it has to stop. So I don't want you to ignore every behavior. You got to stop certain behaviors. So you're all familiar with the, you know, the positive attention, negative attention. What most adults underutilize is what I call sugar-free candy. This is an important one. So when you need to attend to a behavior, attend to it, but take all the sugar out of the response. Basically, that means being neutral, uh, being pretty short, taking all the emotion out. And so, you're, yes, you're giving them like a little M&M, &M, you're giving them some attention for the behavior, but you're not making it super rewarding by adding all this emotion. And involved in emotion, I, I mean like anger, I mean frustration. Um, when I was a student teacher, you know, Johnny, stop interrupting. I hadn't learned these skills yet. I, I'm sure most of you are, you know, much more experienced than I was back when I was student teaching. But the idea is you make it short and neutral then you don't accidentally reinforce it more than you need to. 
I also call it the robot response sometimes. It's like responding like a robot. Um, but think of a candy you don't like. For me, I never like licorice. I don't, I don't know why, but like getting licorice or a sugar-free candy, it's not that great, you know? So you got three types of candy, the sweet candy, sweet attention, sour attention, and a sugar-free. I recommend taking sour attention out of the mix. Use your sweet attention, your active ignoring, shut down the vending machine, and then use your sugar-free candy to address things that you need to address. You're going to see lots of different behaviors on the first day of school. So I want this vending machine analogy to be in your mind if you see, see students start to shake your machine. Um, kids will learn what buttons to press, right? Why, wh here's one. Why do kids press buttons? Because they work, right? If uh, you hand a child an Xbox controller and the batteries are dead, they're going to press the buttons for five seconds, get bored, and then look for another controller. If you have a co-teacher in the classroom, you might see that some students will be pressing buttons and behaving well for one teacher and not for the other. And that's usually because this vending machine analogy plays out where there's two vending machines and you figure out which one will give you the, the candy you want. Okay, so I'm, I'm hoping that this analogy is, is helpful. There's a few other things uh, related to candy and attention that I'm gonna get to before moving forward. So the holy grail of class management skills has to do with using your attention strategically, okay? I call it the public display of attention. Acronym here is PDA, okay? I use the, the PDA acronym. I, I created this uh, initially for, you know, high school and then college camp counselors, and you try to figure out something funny that they can really hold on to. But I think it applies for everyone to really consider here. PDA, public display of attention. What that means is during moments where students are being good, you call out the positive behaviors in front of everyone. It's like the ice cream sundae of attention. Um, this is great for any time you're trying to rally up students to, to, to cooperate in doing something. For example, let's say you're lining up your students in your classroom before you head out, okay? Now, when I was a student teacher and before I learned some of this stuff, let's say little Johnny was wandering out of line. Actually, this one would happen sometimes, swinging his backpack around right? Because that's more fun than getting in line. This is where I would say, Johnny, Johnny, put the backpack down, get in line. It's like tossing them Snickers bars for doing the wrong thing, right? He's just going to keep on doing it. And then the other kids might start twirling their bags because they want Snickers bars too. So instead, and this is not intuitive, at least it wasn't for me. And for a lot of people, it's not. You actually ignore the swinging as long as it's not dangerous. And you notice the kids that are getting into line. Kevin just got into line. Thank you, Kevin, for listening. Jenny's in line. Harriet, thank you for getting in line. Harriet is kind of a, it's kind of an older name. I don't know how many young kids are named Harriet nowadays, but the idea is if you call out the good stuff, you will see the kids like actually scurry into line because they want their own public display of attention. And then eventually Johnny, who's been meandering and swinging his bag, gets bored of that because he's not getting any attention for it. And then he meanders into line. And then as soon as he's in line, ah, thanks, Johnny. Appreciate you getting into line. So in that scenario, you've just shaped his behavior in a positive direction without using any negativity, any sour attention. So not only did you not reward the out-of-line behavior, but you also didn't take a hit on your, on your teacher-child relationship, and you haven't reduced the self-esteem. You've used just sweet attention to shape it. If any of you are gym teachers, I mean, there's so much corralling kids and getting them to be in certain, situa uh, certain places, like any kind of group management stuff please consider like the PDA, right? The public display of attention. If we're talking about high schoolers, I know it seems a little bit less applicable because how often are you get like rallying high schoolers to sit certain places? But if a, if a high schooler on a paper writes a certain paragraph a certain way, let's say they, they nailed the topic sentence each, each time and you in, in class say, hey, Kevin, in this paper, he had these amazing topic sentences. And what he did here, I'm not a writing teacher. You probably have better ideas than I do here, but you specify it. And then there's going to be other kids who are like, ah, oh, I want to get called out next time. Right. And so by doing that kind of a public display of attention, kids know what they need to do to get your attention. Now, of course, I'm not saying have a favorite and like call them out every time. You'd want to spread this out among all your students. But um, OK, so the PDA, very important class management skill. Now. Something's going to happen if you ignore a behavior, and we got to talk about it. 
I'm going to uh, draw something here for you. So let's say um, on this side is behavior and this side is time. Now this is uh, something that my supervisor at NYU Child Study Center years ago, uh, Dr. Yamalas Diaz taught. So I always call it the Yamalas Diaz de-escalation curve. Um, I like to give credit where it's due because there's a lot of good ideas out there that I just kind of bring together for a presentation. But the idea here is that if you're gonna ignore a behavior, it's gonna get worse. The same way that when it came to, um, you know, this is across species, this isn't just humans. If there's, a, if there's a rat in a cage and there's a lever, and every time the rat hits the lever, they get food, right? And then suddenly the lever doesn't give food, the rat's gonna hit the lever harder and faster. The intensity increases, the frequency increases, until eventually they're like, I'm not getting any food out of this. And then they give up. That's what this graph is. All right. And that's what the vending machine analogy stands for, right? It's just candy, instead, the candy of your attention instead of food. So there are three sections to this. Uh, one of the first times I presented on this, I said there were three quadrants. And I got called out immediately uh, because apparently you can't have three quadrants, you need four. I'm sure as educators, you, you probably would have called me out right away. So now I take the opportunity to teach people uh, you can't have three quadrants. So three sections. The first section, this is when the behavior starts, okay? You have the option to redirect. You have the option to use sugar-free candy. And I recommend while you redirect using sugar-free candy. And then there's a skill of validation that we're gonna get to next. So in the beginning, you can, you know, you can interact with the student. However, during phase two, section two here, I'm gonna use red, uh, red font, because I really want to this to stick in your minds here. This is no man's land. Stay out. Ignore. The idea here is this is where the student is really shaking the vending machine, right? This is where if, if you finally attend to the behavior right here, they learn as long as I escalate high enough, I will get the candy I want or I will get out of the situation that I wanna get out of. And often what happens is if you start to interact at this point, let me go back to the red, the behavior actually extends and gets worse before it comes down. Like uh, my supervisor, Dr. Diaz would say, you don't wanna feed the meter on the wrong behavior. If you start interacting at this stage, then you are feeding the meter of behavioral escalation. And it's going to make your day and the child's day harder. Obviously, if, if this is aggressive behavior coming out or really inappropriate or disruptive, like then yes, you got to use the sugar-free candy and, and end it. But you don't want to allow the child to get the candy of your attention for just escalation that's not like totally disruptive. Okay. And then on the other side here, that's where you give your label praises. Dr. Diaz used to call it a love sandwich. Say, all right, thank you so much for you know, calming down, for being respectful. It's not okay to interrupt. That's the negative here. And then, but I appreciate that we're back on the same page and we're gonna have a great day. All right, so you show the attention. It's where you reopen the vending machine on the other side of this. It's called the extinction burst, by the way. It's kind of a, like a pretty interesting name. But the idea is you, when the behavior is about to become extinct, right? because you're not feeding it with candy anymore of your attention, it bursts first. So be prepared for the extinction burst if you're going to ignore a behavior. I know there's a lot of content here, which is why there's a bunch of things you can download after to, to review this. Okay, day one, right? You're a vending machine, you choose how to use your attention. We're gonna move on now to the, to the second aspect of this presentation, which is about emotions. Let me just stop the screen share. Okay. Emotions. Um, what I'm going to teach is really for all humans, all human emotions. It's going to apply to you as teachers, you as people, and your students. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I wish I learned before I was 30, uh, but I didn't learn until afterwards. So I'm hoping that this is just beneficial in general to know, but it certainly applies to your students. Okay. Emotions 
are like reflexes. What I mean by that is that they are not a choice. People do not choose to feel intense emotions. Emotions happen to us. So I, I like to draw the, the analogy to a reflex because it's not really an analogy. It's actually what it is, it's physiological reflex, the way that your nervous system is wired. If I were in person with you, giving an in-person presentation, this is where I'd ask, some, I'd ask someone, uh, would someone volunteer to let me clap in their face? And usually someone says yes. And so I go like this and they blink. Now, I imagine none of you were blinking. I've learned that it doesn't work across the screen. But the point is, if you, had, if you did blink, I would say, why'd you blink? Why'd you blink so hard? Like, did you think I was gonna poke you in the eye or something? Now that hopefully doesn't make sense. Like, why would I criticize someone for a reflex, right? If you, if you go to the doctor's office, and the doctor takes that, that hammer thing. I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't know the name of that. I'm a psychologist, but they hit you in the knee. Your knee goes up. If the doctor was like, whoa, did you mean to do that? Why'd your knee go up so hard? It doesn't make sense. It's a reflex. And then lastly, if I were to shine a flashlight in your eyeball, right? And your pupil constricted. And I were like, whoa, like your pupil got so small. Like how did it get so small? That's kind of weird. You shouldn't make it that small. I'm hoping your response to this is that I am being totally absurd. Like that's just weird and absurd. This is actually what it's like when we tell someone else that they're overreacting, that they shouldn't be angry, that they should just relax. I think we've all had experiences like that and we've all told other people these things, but it's, it's not in line with the actual biology. Biology is we do not control the emotion we feel or how intense we feel it. What we do have control over is what we do with the emotion after it's triggered, right? That is what we have control over. So what do children and adults, what are their options once an emotion has been triggered? Number one, they can internalize it. In psychology, we also call it suppression, repression. So this looks like pushing the emotion down. It looks like thinking instead of feeling. So for people that have experiences with anxiety, which is pretty much everybody, if your mind is racing and you're obsessing, obsessing, or ruminating and ruminating, that's because you're not fully feeling an emotion and processing and moving on, which is why a week later, you might still be thinking and thinking and thinking about it, right? It's internalized. It hasn't been fully dealt with. You take the kids who, um, I don't know, if a friend hurt their feelings or, uh, or a teenager who just feels like they failed at a test and they totally withdraw and shut down, internalizing, right? Then there's the opposite side of the spectrum here, externalizing. That's where you don't want to feel the emotion, so you get it out. You lash it out on someone else. Anyone here been frustrated or anxious? And so you're short with uh, your students, your friends, your, your partner, your parents. I think it's one of the most common human ways of dealing with emotion is that we, we, we externalize. Kids, kids very often externalize their behaviors, right? They often get a lot of attention for externalizing it too. They get a lot of candy for it. Okay, that's number two. The third way a child or human can deal with an emotion is just avoid it, right? So when an emotion's triggered, get out of that situation. You see this a lot with kids that are uh, separation anxious, right? They just will cling to their parents or the kids that are not willing to do the writing assignments because the executive functioning involved there is just stresses them out, right? So they just refuse to do it. So avoidance is just removing the trigger from the situation entirely. None of that's, none of that's very healthy. What is the healthy way to deal with an emotion? That we call it emotional acceptance. For anyone here who's familiar with mindfulness, meditation, where you're not trying to change things, you just allow them. That's what this is. Um, it's a way of helping a child to do something, even if they're afraid or to be, or to control their body, even if they're really angry. Children don't naturally accept their emotions. They usually need an adult's help to do it. All right. So that's where we're going with this, but you might've wondered why I had this beach ball it's for this analogy. Uh, this is another analogy. I did not make up. If anyone knows where it came from, please thank them for me. I just add bells and whistles to things. So let's say, here's your emotion. Okay. You ever been in a pool? You ever taken a beach ball in a pool and push it underwater? 
Okay, I hope you have because it takes some effort, right? So let's say you have this emotion, you do not want to feel it. So you push it down. Now, this is internalizing. Are you able to swim around the pool? Not really. Can you play uh, Marco Polo with your family? Not really. You're busy pressing down, pushing down the emotion, right? And then what happens when you get tired of pushing this emotion underwater or you get distracted or a beach ball hits you in the head and you let go? Does the emotion slowly rise to the surface? No, it usually explodes. I actually caught it. Yeah, it explodes. This is where the externalizing comes in. And I imagine most people here have had that experience where they're holding something in, holding something in, then there's a straw that breaks the camel's back and there's an explosion. You're going to see that in your classroom too with these kids that are holding in their emotions. So we don't want that. Now, can the beach ball, can the emotion just float on the surface of the water? Let me see if I can line this up if this is the water, right? Now, is the emotion still here? Yeah, it's there. Are my hands free to swim around the pool if I wasn't holding this up? Yeah. Can I play Marco Polo with my family? Totally. I might feel sad or angry or, or anxious while I do it because the emotion's still there, but I can. And then what happens over time? The emotion might just float away on its own, right? So that, that's how we process and move on. So why do I go into this whole didactic on emotions? Because I want you to understand the process happening in the classroom with each of your kids. These kids are gonna be adjusting back to school and they're gonna have so many emotions. Anxiety is gonna be real high. There's gonna be a lot of frustration in terms of re-engaging with coursework. I mean, there are kids that, uh, you know, last year, there just wasn't too much follow through due to Zoom and all the rest and, and staying on top of work wasn't important. I had a lot of patience that this, their motivation went out the window. So now they gotta sit down and actually work. They're gonna have emotions about that, probably frustration and anxiety. So what can you do here? You have this amazing power as an adult and an educator in their life to teach them that it is okay to feel what they feel. Many kids at home, they're not taught that. Boys are taught not to cry sometimes, hopefully not as much nowadays. Um, people are taught that they're overreacting, that they shouldn't be worried about it, that going to school should be no big deal. They've been doing it for years, all that stuff. That's invalidation. Oh, okay. I bet you've experienced invalidation. Has there been a moment in your life where you have had uh, someone tell you, a parent, friend, a partner, you're overreacting, you're being silly, just relax, okay? Was your response, oh, oh, oh thank you. Oh, I'm just, I'm just overreacting. Oh, wow, I can really relax now. I'm gonna have a great day. Is that how it went? Probably not, right? Usually what happens is people get more frustrated than they were before. A child, this is their emotion, and you tell them it's no big deal, right? I'm not saying that's your, that would be what your approach is, but I'm just trying to show what it'd be like. It's no big deal. You've done this before. It's easy. The child will then take that emotion and shove it in your face, right? They amplify it because they want to feel understood. Now, not only do you have the initial emotion to work through, you've got another layer of difficult emotions that are in the situation. And the lesson the child has learned is that it's not okay to feel the way I feel. And so then they learn to suppress and then they get back into that whole cycle of suppression, internalizing, and externalizing, all that. So the skill here that I'm sure you've all heard of in one form or another is emotional validation. This is where you tell the student that it's okay to feel the way they feel, that it makes sense, that you've been there before. Right, so if it's a separation anxiety child on the first day of school, you would say, this is tough. You know, you've been at home for a while. I understand, it's hard. I would be nervous too, right? And we gotta practice being brave here, right? So I'm not saying that you validate their avoidance and say like, it's okay to not participate. I'm saying you validate the emotion that's underneath the avoidance. If a student is handing in work late, right? And they ask them for an extension, Rather than saying, you know, you, you're, you're a junior in high school, you should have this down by now. You would say, hey, like last year was kind of crazy. It was tough. Like it, this is a skill that takes time to redevelop. Like I understand why this has been tough for you. When you do that, 
they have this emotion that they're like guarding, they can put it down. And when they're put down that emotion, their hands are free to receive your feedback, right? Rather than them just shoving the emotion in your face. So I'm not saying give them an extension. I'm saying, hey, this is tough. This is a tough year. And at the same time, I'm not giving you an extension, right? Because this is a skill we have to redevelop. It's up to you whether you actually give the extension or not. The point is you validate the, the, the frustration and the emotion underneath it. And in, in doing so, you're teaching them that it's okay to feel the way they feel. Super important. Now, for those of you who have been listening very carefully, you may notice a little inconsistency or paradox in what I was saying. So first I was saying, you know, when, when kids are acting up and there's this uh, uh, escalation, ignore. Now I'm saying, when there's this emotional escalation, like have a conversation with them. Look them, you know, like get down on their level, look them in the eye, say, it's okay to feel that way. So what do you do? Okay. There's a, some nuance here, obviously, but the idea is, there's another acronym I'm about to use. You ever seen a kid or a student behave a certain way and you're thinking in your mind, WTF? And I'm not gonna say what that stands for, but you know what it stands for? I actually want you to say that in your mind. WTF is going on with this behavior. What's the function of that behavior? Okay. What's the function of the behavior? Because if the behavior is just because the child is bored and seeking attention, do not give it attention or else it reinforces it. If the child is just genuinely upset because a friend hurt their feelings, because they're anxious about a test, because there is, uh, you know, having trouble getting stuff in time, in on in time. If they're actually having an emotional reaction that's not about just attention, please validate. And then if the behavior continues after you validate it, then you can go on to ignore. That's why in the, um, let's see, in the, the whiteboard, let's just, I think, it, oh yeah, here, validation, right? When the behavior starts, you validate some of the emotions there. Um, okay. As you know, easier said than done. Right, you can't. You got twenty-five students in a classroom. You're going to validate every single one of their emotions as it happens. No, it's you know, it's that's just unrealistic. So we're shooting for good enough, right? It's just the best you can. Now, um, I'm noticing we're running a little low on time, so I'm I'm choosing between a few different things that I can wrap up with. Let's quickly talk about anxiety in a little more detail. So, imagine. Right now, and maybe in your, in your room, I don't know where a door is, the door is there, there behind you. Imagine a grizzly bear, right? Were to come in your room right now. What would happen like that? Heart would start beating, right? You need, you need blood in your muscles to survive. Here, start breathing fast, right? You need oxygen in your muscles to survive. Your stomach, the blood in your digestive system isn't needed to digest. So it leaves the digestive system. And then that feels really weird and uncomfortable. You ever had students or your own children say they have a stomach ache? Right? So this is the anxiety alarm system. All of us have it. It's helpful. If we were to just say, hey, there's a grizzly bear. Cool, let's pet it. Right? We would get eaten. Right? So we have this because it keeps us alive. Now, was that a choice to feel anxious when that grizzly bear walked in the room? Nope. It was automatic, reflexive. Okay? So the kids that are coming in to school this year are going to have sensitive alarm systems. Right? And sensitivities to different things plenty of separation anxiety, a lot of COVID anxiety. You know, there's going to be a lot of that. So as this happens, you expect they're going to have strong reactions and reactions that from your perspective may be an overreaction, right? It's not in, it's not in proportion to the actual danger because usually there's not danger. That's why it's a false alarm. But the idea here is that if you understand the biology of it, you, you don't judge it. You have compassion for it. This child's alarm system is going off. And they, it's, not, it's not their fault. It is their choice what to do with it, though. And so the illustration, the visual I like to do here is the ladder. So in therapy, we, we call them fear ladders or fear hierarchies. So you got this hierarchy here. All right, sorry, the ladder here. And then let's say your student is down here. Okay, little Johnny, climb that ladder. Come on, Johnny. You did it last year. What's Johnny going to do? Depending on his age and his temperament, maybe he'll cry. Maybe he'll withdraw. Maybe he'll throw a tantrum. 
maybe he'll just shut down. But the idea here is that his alarm system is going off so hard, it's just not feasible to climb that ladder, even though from your perspective, it may look easy. So every time you see a child that's anxious and avoiding, your role is to try to help him find lower rungs on the ladder, all right? You're all familiar with scaffolding. Uh, it's, this is kind of like a, you know emotional scaffolding, anxiety scaffolding. So you, you, you validate the child for, you know, I understand this is your, the first math test you've taken in months in person. Like, you know, I, I would be nervous too. Like it's, this is hard, it's okay to feel nervous. And so you might make the math test a little bit easier the first time around. Or, I mean, I wouldn't do this with tests, but let's say you're doing assignments. You might have the, the student only have half of the assignments. You guys know better than I do how to scaffold. Um, if, it, if the child's anxious about speaking in school, we have some, some students that were speaking fine and then they have a year on Zoom and now they're back in school and they're having trouble raising their hand in class. So the rungs would be first you have them speak with, oh, and by the way, answering a question in front of everyone in a loud voice is like having them climb a ladder without rungs for some kids. So you'd have them first just with a partner and a friend they know, you know, that's one rung. Then you have them with a group of people, but not participating in front of the whole class. Then if they're, you know, if they're younger, you might have them answer in like a soft or whisper voice and then a full voice. But yeah, I understand the principle here is that as the teacher, you can help them to really climb the ladder in a gradual way so that they can desensitize that alarm system and be comfortable with participation, comfortable separating, comfortable as comfortable as can be around COVID. Um, there's a lot of you know, nuance that goes into anxiety work, but you get the general idea here. Um, okay, there's a, there's a few minutes left. So I, I do have time to talk about the final, final thing I wanted to discuss, which is there's, there's various approaches to, to teaching and to leadership. So I, I wrote an article about what I call relationship-based leadership, and it, it really transfers over well to teaching or anything where you're, like, where you're a leader. And as an educator, certainly a leader. So there, there's three approaches that, I, that I've categorized it into that I think is digestible. First, power-based education. This is where the primary motivator for students to perform is the teacher leveraging their authority. So because I'm the teacher, you got to follow directions. Teachers often rely on sour attention if they're power-based, right? So it's, it's, it, it tends to be that the, the student doesn't want to anger the teacher or frustrate the teacher, and that's what motivates them to do stuff. It works, by the way, in the short term. You can really corral a group of students and get them to do something if you raise your voice really loud. Long term, though, if you've gotten to the habit the way that I have in the past, it leads to issues. There's low morale in the classroom. Kids are um, actually they can become motivated to oppose the teacher. Right. So that's one form. Next, incentive based education. This is where you're using uh, sticker charts, reward systems, you know, the traffic signals for behavior and most commonly grades. Right. That's what motivates the child to perform. And then there's relationship based education. And this is where, and I have this in the handout written down, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say it a few times because this is important. This is where the motivation from the child, it really comes from the teacher's genuine investment in the personal and perfect, not, not professional, in the personal and social, emotional and academic development of the student. There's a caveat I'm going to get to, but so the teacher is genuinely invested in the academic, social, and emotional development of the student. Caveat being, regardless of their performance or behavior in class. So that means equal investment in, in every student, which is very difficult to do. Um, in fact, sometimes the students that act out are the ones that need even more investment. So the, the analogy that uh, I first saw in Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, and a, a mentor of mine, Bob Ditter, used it a lot as well. Um, it's the relationship bank account analogy. The idea is that every positive interaction you have with a student is like putting a deposit into the bank account, right? So every time you use sweet attention, every time you have a conversation about Marvel movies, or you're talking to a high school senior about their varsity sport they're playing, right? These are all deposits in the bank account. The relationship gets stronger. Now, every time you give a command, Every time you tell a student to quiet down, every time you give a criticism, every time you raise your voice, those are withdrawals, okay? The idea is you need money in the bank with your students. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to make those withdrawals. 
And there are certain students that you have to be very careful about getting bankrupt with. Those are the students that tend to act out the most or cause the most difficulties in class. So with those students, even though you may not want to invest more in them because they're really frustrated, they can be frustrating. They need it the most because when you have a relationship bank account that's bankrupt, that's where students actually become motivated to oppose the teacher rather than comply. Okay, it's tough, it's, it, it's hard. But on day one, these students are gonna walk into class and they're going to have preconceptions of what, how people view them. You know, I'm a good listener or I'm a troublemaker. And on day one, they're gonna figure out whether you're a power-based teacher or a relationship-based teacher. And the most important thing is that as a teacher, you can see potential in kids that they don't see in themselves. And so by having a relationship-based approach, you can actually teach kids their potential by responding differently than their parents have and teachers have in the past by using the skills that I talked about today. So I know I'm running into the, the uh, Q&A time, but there's one quick experiential exercise I wanna do, and then we'll go into Q&A. I want you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with it. I'm gonna close mine. And I, I'd, I'd just like you to think about a person in your life, someone that was likely older than you, and it could be at any point in your life, that saw potential in yourself that you didn't see. It could be a parent, it could be a coach, it, it could be a teacher that inspired you to go into this profession, it could be an educator. And just think about the, what it was about them and about their investment in you that made you grow into a person more than you realized you could become. And people, you know, not everyone has like one person, but I'm, right now I'm thinking about Mr. Carlin, my fourth grade teacher. Gets, he gets a, a PDA, a shout out. Um, so just think about that person for a moment. I'll be quiet for a second as you do. Okay. Um, if you're like me, you might have really thought about them almost as a mentor, more so than an educator or as a coach, right? There, there's a power there that they have that was really influential. And so, yes, you're all educators, but I, I also think you're all mentors. And you have this very important role to play in these students' lives starting day one. And so I hope that you can kind of evoke that image of if you have a person that was a mentor to you as, as something to remind you to, to be a mentor to the kids, even the ones that rub you the wrong way and that push your buttons. Um, so we'll end on that note. I really appreciate, thank you for your attention, right? Um, appreciate the candy of your attention as much as uh, kids do. And I look forward to your questions because I'm sure that putting this into practice is much harder than just presenting on it. So, okay, let's see, I've got a question here. Read it out loud. This is a really, this is really helpful to put it in the candy terms. I'm a social worker at a middle school. Most of the teachers understand and endorse this concept in theory. However, between personal issues, overwhelming competing priorities, stress from family, stress from COVID, extreme pressures from district, day-to-day -day teaching tasks, this concept usually disappears the second day. Yeah, naturally. Uh, how can support providers at school help truly implement this and help teachers and admin sustain this day after stressful after a stressful day? Yeah, uh, whew, great question. Well, I mean, this is the reason I use metaphors, by the way, and analogies, because if it's just a concept that's abstract, it's really hard to cement. I'd, I'd say that um, if, if there's a way to take the concepts like the, you know, the vending machine and candy and have it be part of the, of the overall um, mentality of the school, like this is, this is language that everyone's using, then it'll become really integrated. That's how we do it at camps. Right, the division leaders are using this kind of language, and the counselors are using this kind of language, and so it's just it's just built into it. It's kind of like leadership at different levels, where it's being modeled by the people up top, and then and then it trickles down. Otherwise, uh, we didn't get to self care at all today. There just wasn't time for it. But you can know these principles, and just in the moment, lose your cool, right? Because you're a human, and like I said, 
if you're getting angry in the classroom, that's not your fault. That's a reflex, right? So I do advise using self-care and coping skills just as any other therapist would in order to bring down the emotion, right? If you're taking care of yourself, you'll be less vulnerable to intense emotions. And then you're more likely to be able to, to really do this stuff in the classroom. Great question though. So um, Steve, uh, we yeah. are coming up on time and that was um, one of our only questions. Oh, um, someone else had asked for some examples, but she didn't clarify what she wanted examples on. So Michelle, I'm not sure if you're still with us, if you wanna put in the chat what you wanted examples of. Um, sure, Dr. Mazza would be happy to, to respond. Yeah. Um, but there were lots of good information in the handout. So that was that link was put in the chat. Uh, we do ask you to um, complete our evaluation. Uh, here's the QR code. You can either scan it or I will um, we will put it in the in the chat. Um, again, our funding is tied to our evaluation data. So we do ask you all to to do that. I'll leave it up there for a few minutes. And to those of you that made comments in the chat, really appreciate it. Thank you. There's a lot of nice labeled praises in there. So it was like eating my favorite candy, which is probably, probably a Twix bar. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of positive feedback in the chat for, for, uh, the presentation, everybody loved it. Um, very appreciative for the resources. Um, the next slide is our uh, training assessments. Um, and we're gonna put those links in the chat as well um, for you to do our needs, to complete our needs assessment. The needs assessment allows us to hear from you what types of trainings that you need. Um, so that we can um, focus in on the things that you're saying that you need to guide um, your educational training and technical assistant efforts from us. So um, just gonna go through my slides quickly. Um, we know that some of the information can be triggering. So here is some helplines for you. Please take care of yourself. Um, like Dr. Meza said, we didn't get to the Q and A portion, but um, I mean, we didn't get to the self-care portion, but here are some resources to take care of you. Um, our next session is helping my grieving students when COVID loss comes into the school. So that starts at 145. We'll hope, we hope that you'll join us for our last session um, with Dr. Schoenfeld, uh, who comes to us from the West Coast. And here is our information if you would like to keep in touch with us. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So please visit us on all of those websites. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now in case uh, we, we still have some information going on in the um, chat box. Positive feedback for you, Dr. Mazzo. We thank you very much. The resources are available on the website. So um, Dr. Mazzo was very kind in providing us with a packet. Uh, reviewing some of the concepts that he went over and giving some strategies. So please look at those. They're very thorough and very useful. So again, Dr. Mazza, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope everyone has a good day. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you.